all stand as we worship right now.
Hello, church. All right, all right. It's an awesome day. It's an awesome day. You know, I, uh, I've been over at Seagrass Retirement Facility for about six years almost now, me and my wife. And um, so we minister over there every weekend. So we don't get to church except on Wednesday night. And um, so we've been, uh, we've been doing that for almost six years now. It's just amazing what God has done. And it's just amazing to be here tonight with you guys. But the, the most amazing thing for me is... Easter Sunday, I turned 19. Easter Sunday, I was born again. Uh, Pastor Scott preached, and I was born again 19 years ago on Easter Sunday. And um, believe it or not, it was just, it's, it's incredible what God has done. And um, I met my wife here at the church, um, but well, actually before this building was even here, um, we actually met in uh, elementary school. And so, um, and then we, uh, got married in the building right next door, and this year will be 18 years for us. So, so um, you know, God, don't think that God's not a God of second chances. He is, even a God of third chances. So, so it's just amazing what God can do if you're willing to follow him. I mean, I'm just, I could tell you miracle after miracle. But tonight, um, let me just start by, I want to tell you a little story about a man. He was on vacation in Israel, and he took his wife, and he took his uh, mother-in-law okay and while he was over there with his mother-in-law things were going really good they were having an awesome trip I'm telling you Israel is the place to be from what I understand maybe not today but during that time and while they were there his mother-in-law passed away it was just a terrible circumstance it was just all it was just unforeseen nobody could know it and so the next day the wife said um will you go talk to the the undertaker today I just I just can't do it honey so he went to talk to the undertaker and while he was in there, the undertaker said, listen, um, to ship the, your, your mother-in-law back to America would be $5,000, but we could bury her in the promised land right here for $150. So the man, he thought about it for a minute, and he said, well, no, uh, no, I'd like to ship her back home. I'd like to ship her back home. And so the, the undertaker, he was very perplexed, and he said, well, well, sir, I have to ask, why would you do that? I mean, why would you do that for the value and then to be into the promised land? He goes, well, listen, a couple thousand years ago, I know this guy. And um, after three days, he rose from the dead. And honestly, I can't take that chance. <laughs> All right. Well, with that today, we're going to be in uh, the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 3, uh, 7 through um, 15. So, or actually, 7 through 19. Hebrews 7 through 19. Pastor Scott last week talked on chapter, the beginning of chapter 3. But listen, um. Before we stand, I want to I want to just um, pray, dear Heavenly Father. We just come before you today, and Father, you are just so good. Your mercy abounds, your love abounds, and 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 I'm just so thankful that I could know your love, Father. Father, today I just want to reach out through your Word. Um, today I'd like to sanctify them by your truth, Father. The truth is what sets us free, 
And it doesn't just set us free in our mind. It sets us free in our heart to find your will and to do it as you have called us, Father. And today, as we look into your word, I pray that you will sanctify us by the truth. For your word is the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, I'm just going to talk a little preliminary. Um, You know, in chapter 1, we saw that Jesus was better than the angels. You know, and actually, in uh, chapter 1, we saw in uh, Psalm 45 where God said that to the Son... It shows that God said to God, and it shows us the deity of Jesus as God. You know, and then we move to chapter 2. We're we're told at the beginning of chapter 2, we see a little warning right there, not to drift away, okay? And you say, well, we got to drift, you know, we don't, you know, and and it's a symbol of like a boat, you know, that's untied, that just kind of floats away, and it goes away, and, you know, so, you know, but also, we also begin to see... The Old Testament, the Old Covenant that was given by the angels. And see, I think that's part of the reason that the the Hebrew people had such a high revere for the angels. You know, we see this in Galatians 3.19, Acts 7.53, Deuteronomy Deuteronomy, uh, 33.2, where the law was everything to the Jews and it was given to Moses. Okay, so you can look that up. And, um, and And then we look into the New Covenant. And it doesn't go very deep in chapter 2 yet, but it's going to get deeper, okay? And it's a new and a living way. Chapter 10 is actually, in Hebrews, is actually the culmination of the whole book. And it just summarizes it awesomely. And, and by the time we get there, it's just, if you don't really know the true gospel, you may never know it. I'm telling you, it's just amazing. And um, of, the, of all the books in the Bible, to really understand and know the true gospel, I love the book of Romans, and I put Hebrews right next to it. So if these books are not in your top five, top ten at the most, then you might not even know the true gospel and the way that it comes out. So, so it is amazing to us. But in chapter 2, we see, we see um, the new covenant spoken by Jesus. We see a new and a living way. We see Jesus is fully, fully God, fully man. That human nature was added to his divine nature, and both natures existed in one. Jesus fully understands our weaknesses in chapter 2, and he also is a merciful and high and faithful high priest. And you know, to the Hebrews of that day, only a Levite could be a priest. Only a Levite. And here Jesus was was of the tribe of Judah, and he was just a carpenter. You know, I thought about that. I thought about that. You know, I was just a, for a long time, I was just a handyman, you know, and I, all I did was home repairs, okay, and so I, I felt like it sometimes people looked down on me like I was just a handyman, but you know, I had a, a very high uh, lucrative business for a period of time. I went into construction, and I, and I loved doing work like that, and Jesus was just a carpenter. That's all he was, right? But Jesus was so much more. He was a, he was a merciful and faithful high priest. He has changed everything with the new covenant. We move into, and you know, at the end of of chapter 2, we see where he himself suffered being tempted, but he is able to help those who are tempted. And Jesus loves us. You know, I don't think we really understand sometimes how much God loves us. You know, when I was teaching in the youth, or not the youth, the children's ministry, I was in the children's ministry for many years, and in the children's ministry, there used to be uh, Bill Allen and Kelly Davis. I don't know if you guys know them, but they were my mentors at the time in the church. And um, they used to teach the first catechism um, of the, the Catholic catechism. And what is the chief end of man? Okay, so what is the chief end of man? Does anybody know? Raise your hand if you know. Does anybody know? What is the chief end of man? To glorify God. Okay, that's the first part of it. Okay, we all know we want to glorify God. Okay. But what's the second part is to enjoy him forever, okay? Now, how many of you can say that right now I'm enjoying God forever, okay? And, you know, a lot of times I can see people say, look, I want to glorify God, and I have have all my problems, and all these things are going on. And and listen, today we're going to talk about drifting away. We're going to talk about how you can have a hardened heart. And uh, it even talks about how believers can have an evil heart. Huh? You would never think. Who would think that in Ezekiel, it talks about, Ezekiel 36 tells us that we get a new spirit and a new heart. How could my heart be evil? Huh? So we're going to talk about that a little bit. 
Yeah, today, actually, we're going to talk, um, I have three points today, but they only, uh, my points always go into one. It never is really three, but we're going to talk about the crisis, the cause, and the cure, okay? So, and with that right now, let us go ahead and stand, and we're going to read God's Word, chapter 3 of Hebrews 7 to 19. It's quite a bit, but we'll be able to get through it. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today... If you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion. In the days of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me, I saw your works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation, and I said, they always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren. You see that, brethren. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion and the failure in the wilderness. For who, having heard rebelled indeed was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses now with whom was he angry 40 years was it not those who sinned whose corpses fell in the wilderness and whom did he swear that they should not enter his rest but those who did not obey so that they would not enter in because of unbelief you may be seated you know It's a pretty heavy text. I mean, it is really, to me, it is heavy. And I'll be honest, I believe we could break this down into into more than one sermon. But we're going to get through this today. And, um, you know, when you see the word therefore in verse 7, we have to go back. And, you know, we know that we look at the house. We talked about the house last week, the house that Jesus built. And Moses is of the house, okay? Moses was an incredible man of God. He was faithful for 40 years. Faithful. He wasn't faithful for the whole time, but he was faithful, okay? And he continued all the way to the end of his life. But as I see, it says in verse verse 6, let's look at it. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are. Now watch this. If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end if we hold fast to what we have learned if we hold fast to our salvation if we hold fast to what God has given us and rejoice in the hope and look this hope is not just any hope this is a confident assuring hope when you really know the one and true Jesus Christ and um, so it's amazing but see the problem that I see a lot of times within the church and listen after 19 years, I can say I've seen a few things in Hibernia. And you know what? I love my church. I love my pastors. I love Scott. Um, he is my father in the faith. And uh, listen, I'm telling you, man, it's, it's awesome. Um, and, and the dynamics of a church change over time. And, and I've seen it change, but it never, it never goes away. It's just, it's just awesome and it's beautiful. And all the pastors here, I know they love Jesus. They want to help you in Jesus. And, and listen. They're not going to enable you, but they will definitely help you. And that's, that's an awesome thing. It really is. And, um, but here it is to be faithful to the end. I see so many people that after a period of time, they bring their kids in the church. They want, their, church, they want their, their kids to know Jesus. And once they get 18, 19, 20 years old, they disappear and you never see them again. And I've seen teachers, some of the greatest teachers I've ever seen in the church, during that time, come and they do awesome. And then all of a sudden, they just disappear. And they, they, they just fade out. And listen, this is, this is a journey to the end. This is where we run the race all the way to the end, okay? You know, as I'm in ministry and I, and I am teaching to people, and I have one lady in my group that's going to be 100 years old this year, okay? And, um, and I've, had, uh, I've had other people uh, older than that, okay? So, but these people have continued. Through the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I'm going to tell you, life's difficult. Life is not easy, okay? But I have seen them continue and be faithful to the Lord. It's awesome. You know, so, so here we are. Verse 7. As the Holy Spirit 
says. You know, you want to hear a word from God tonight? Here it is, right here. You know, in Hebrews 4.12, it says, For the word of God is a living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Now listen to this. Piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents, in, and intents of the heart. Okay? And really tonight, that's what we're talking about is a heart issue. So here it is, the word of God, you know, and, and in 2 Peter 1.21, it says, Prophecy never came by the will of man, but by holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So if you want to see a word of God from God, here it is right here, as the Holy Spirit speaks. Now we're going to look into Psalm 95. Now, we're only going to see the second half of Psalm 95. The first half of Psalm 95 is, is about worship and obedience okay you know God doesn't really care about your sacrifice he cares about your obedience okay and that's the truth right there he wants an obedient people you can sacrifice all day long but obedience is really what he he wants now we're only going to see the second half and listen if you get a chance to read the first half and it doesn't move you then maybe you don't know Jesus I'm going to tell you right now, I sat down. Now listen, the Word touches every one of us at different levels and different times. And I've seen the Word, and I remember I was just sitting down, and I'm studying the last half of Psalm 95, and then all of a sudden I look, and I said, well, let me look at the first half. And I started looking at it for two hours. I never moved out of my chair. You know, we praise God, right? You want to praise God. But when we worship God, what do you do? You bow down and worship. You know, a lot of times when I sing and, the, and, the, and, the, and I sing and the music's going, I have to put my head down so I can concentrate because I get too carried away sometimes, you know. But I'll tell you something. It's just an awesome. You need to read that. And uh, I know we're not going to have time tonight, but it's, it's beautiful. But it says today in verse, in verse 7, today if you will hear his voice. You know, he doesn't say anything about tomorrow. He doesn't say anything about yesterday. He doesn't say anything about someday, but today. You know, in Matthew 6, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things shall be added unto you. And then verse 34 says, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own self. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You know what? We don't need to worry about tomorrow. Now look, that doesn't mean we don't prepare, okay? We do. I mean, I'm going on a trip. I'm, I'm getting ready to go uh, the 15th. I'm going with Tim Larson. Uh, we're going down to uh, Concepcion, uh, Chile. I'm going on my first r mission trip to a foreign country that, uh, you know, it's kind of crazy, but I'm going with an evangelist. And that's my gift is evangelism. I love it. I'm excited about it. I'm looking forward to it. Um, so, but, but he, so there is a time of preparation. But listen, there are so many things going on in our lives we need to keep our focus where we need to keep it. And, you know, a lot of times as the day goes on, we forget all about Jesus. And everybody goes, oh, I don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. I, I read my scriptures. I did my five minutes in the morning. I'm good. But you know what? God really wants you to dwell on his word all day. You know, if you can think about your problems, okay? You know, if something happens to one of your children, um, if something's going on with your family, if there's a problem with your relationship with your wife, that's what you're thinking about all day. If you can think about that all day and do your work, can't you just think about God a little bit? I think about God all day. As a matter of fact, I hire a guy. I want to hire somebody at my shop that they think about God too. I want to bounce off of them. And I have, a, I have a guy, he's 75 years old at my shop. It's awesome. It's awesome. And I'll tell you what, we bounce off each other all the time. And uh, he's a little Pentecostal, but I'm telling you what, it's awesome, man. I'm, I love it. I love it. <laughs> hey, ain't nothing like a good Pentecostal. Huh? I might be a Bapticostal. Like uh, Brother Walter St. Clair used to say, he'd do a Bapticostal shuffle, you know. So. But anyways, all right, let's get back to the scriptures. Today, today he says, today, do not harden your hearts. Well, you know, hardening of the heart is synonymous with unbelief, okay? It is synonymous with unbelief. You know, I, I was, I've been reading, I've been teaching the Gospel of Mark. It's kind of interesting. Uh, I had never taught the Gospel of Mark, and Pastor Scott was like, 
I'm teaching the gospel of I'm, you know, Mark, and I was like, I never did it, and I never realized how great it was till I got into it. Now that I'm into it, I'm seeing things that I've, I've just never really noticed in the other, in the other teachings. And, uh, but a lot about unbelief, a lot about hard hearts. And, uh, you know, before you can hear, you do have to make a choice. Before you can hear God's, God's words. And listen, this psalm is actually attributed to David, but we really don't know if David wrote it. But, you know, David wrote a lot of the psalms, so it may be attributed to him. But the second half of this psalm is actually a warning, okay? And it's a warning, but it's also about the children of Israel, how the Jewish people had come out of the out of, out of uh, Egypt, and they're going in toward the promised land, okay? And during that, we see, as they're coming out, we see the 10 miracles, okay? We send the, see the 10 miracles in Egypt. We see the Red Sea parting, right? Could you imagine being a Jewish person and seeing the Red Sea part and walking across dry land, and you're led by a pillar of cloud in the day and a, and a, and a pillar of fire at night? And here they were running around in the wilderness, and here God is teaching them. And actually, they had been in Egypt over 400 years, okay? About 390 years when Moses actually made the mistake of going out and murdering a man, thinking he was going to help his people, right? Okay? You know, that was not, that was not what God's plan was not for Moses to murder somebody. If you think it was, then, then you need to rethink what God, who God is. But 430 years, and on the way out, God was trying to teach them. And then by the time they get to Numbers 13, we see the 12 spies go into the promised land, okay? And as they go into the promised land, there's two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, come out and they go, oh man, this is awesome. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm excited about it. We can, we can take these people. And all the other spies, they're like, no, man, we can't do it. No, nah, ain't no way. You know, I mean, oh, by the way, God fed them every day, okay? God kept their clothes working. They didn't get new clothes every year, you know? They were going around the wilderness. And, and God had provided everything they needed. And yet they were an obstinate people. They were hard-hearted. And as they get out, 10 of the spies said no, and the people said, we'll never, we're not going in there. And God said, well, that's fine. You don't have to go in there. You know, God's not going to force you to do anything. You know that? God loves you so much, but he's not going to force you to do anything. He wants you to do it of your free will, and that's why he gave us free will. And so, um, so here they are, a generation of unbelief, a generation that will die in the wilderness. And Moses, now, he, now don't, don't get me wrong, Moses wasn't perfect, but Moses was faithful. And Moses is going to die in the wilderness too after 40 years. So as we see in verse 9, it says that where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years that I would, and then in verse 10, it says that I was angry with that generation. You know, if you look into the psalm, it says that he was grieved, okay? I would say disappointed, okay? You know, he he held out 40 years. He still waited on. And though they were going to die, you know, Moses, he messed up at the rock of Kadesh. You know, and he, he was, he pounced on a stone. He was supposed to bring water by speaking to the rock. You know that, right? Okay. And he didn't. And he beat on the, he said, you people are just so, he just got tired of them. And number, I think it's Numbers 20. And in Numbers 20, you know, Miriam had just died. At the end of Numbers 20, Aaron died. So in between that's when he pounded on the rock. Okay. He was supposed to speak to it, you know, and, and, and he, you know, to put up with the people for 40 years, you know, I could imagine, can you imagine a pastor having to put up with an obstinate, unloving people for 40 years? Could you even imagine that? That's Moses. He prayed for the people. He loved them. And they, man, they didn't show it. I'll tell you. You know, as we, get, as we get out of that, we get through verse 11. That generation would die in the wilderness and not enter the promised land. That's the rest, okay? Would not enter his rest. That means that they did not enter the promised land, okay? 
So we're coming to verse 12, and this is where I want you to see the crisis, okay? This is a crisis that can happen to a Christian, to a follower, okay? And this is how fast it can happen. In verse 12, in verse chapter 2, verse 1, if you look over there, it says, Therefore we must give more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. And it's kind of like a boat that doesn't have its mooring, and all of a sudden it just, it just floats away, and next thing you know, it's gone. You don't even know where it went. And you know, have you ever seen a boat? You, you drive around um, on the St. John's River and you see a boat that's just in the middle of nowhere up against the shore. And you're like, how did that get there? Same thing, same thing, okay? So he says, beware, brethren, okay? So he's talking to us. Lest there be in any of, an, and now he's talking actually to the Jewish people, okay, <laughs> that are believers. They have an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. You know, Ezekiel 36 says, you know, you're gonna, I'm going to give you a new heart and a new spirit. And I want to just say something about that real quick, and we'll move on. When you get born again, if you had an 80 IQ, do you think you're going to have a higher IQ? Huh? That's basically saying if you're not that smart, do you think you're going to be any smarter when you get born again? No, you're not. If you're as big as a house when you get born again, do you think you're going to be thinner? No, you're going to be just as big. You get a new spirit, okay? And you're born again. The problem is our mind has not been changed, okay? Our heart has been changed, and our wants will change. And I see a lot of people, and I see a lot of people, especially um, in, the, you know, a lot of people, say, and he says today, I see a lot of people say, oh, not today. I don't have time today. Um, listen, I got to get my house cleaned up. I got, I got, I got a lot of work going on. Um, maybe next week. Maybe next week. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that church thing next week. You know, I'll get back. I know I'll, I'll get back, I promise. Y'all hear that before? I've heard that a bunch of times. Oh, I'll do it. No, no, no. Today. Today is the day. You know, it, you know when a person drifts away, when a person gets a heart, their heart get, becomes hardened, and it becomes a heart of unbelief, it doesn't magically just come back at one time, Okay? It just, it takes time. It takes time to believe. It takes time for the scriptures to soak in. But there has to be a start somewhere, okay? There has to be a start somewhere. So here we see the crisis. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. And I'm like, who would do that? Who as a follower would do that? I've seen it happen, guys. I'm telling you, I've seen it happen. I've seen people do stuff, and I had no idea that it was even possible to do as a Christian. And, you know, say, and I see this all the time. Well, they weren't really Christians. It's like, Dad, you don't know what they were. I'm not even going to go around and try and figure that out. I just want to help them to get back to where they should be. Beware, brethren. You know, one of the things that we need to be aware of is what our focus is on, okay? What is your focus on? And who do you spend your most time with? You know, the, we're, I hear this all the time, you become like the people you're around, all right? So who are you hanging around with? Who are you being with? And what is your focus on? You know, if you're gonna have spiritual connection and you're gonna be with God and you're gonna walk with God and you're gonna know God, you gotta spend time with, with God, okay? One of the things about the pastors here, I could call them up. I bet it's some of them 5 o'clock in the morning. I know because I have. And you know what they're doing? They're studying their Bible. Okay? They're learning. They're growing. They don't want to drift away. Because it's terrible what can happen. Oh, my word. Who would want to say, you know. And you know what? When I became a Christian, I never thought that I could have an evil heart. But it's possible. It is. But, you know, when your heart is hard, it's, 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 it's unsensitive, it's unfeeling, it's unloving, and it pulls away from God. But when, your heart, when you're following God and you seek God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, then your heart becomes more sensitive to when God speaks and God talks. You know, Easter, I'll tell you real quick, Easter. Look, Easter's a busy time, right? Come on, it's a family time, right? Listen, God, I have, a, I have ladies all the time in a hospital, um, hospice, 
So I got a, one lady, she's 88, and uh, God told me that I needed to go see her on Easter. And I knew that there wasn't enough time. And I'm thinking, I'm just going to walk in, I'm going to pray with her, and I'm going to be gone. But I walked in, and I never met her brother, and he was there, and he wanted to talk. And I knew that dinner with the wife and the kids was at a certain time. But you know what? I'll tell you something. Claudia was under a lot of medication, severe cancer all over her body, everywhere. It was her younger brother. He said, this is like my mother. I didn't even know that this guy existed, okay? I knew, that, I knew her son. I'd met him. But I'm going to tell you something. There, I was there for a reason. And I didn't realize it till afterwards. When I was there, I talked with him for, till, till he would let me talk. And then I would go over and I said, let's go over and see Claudia. And she was just out, out under a lot of heavy medication. I walked up and I grabbed her hand. I put my hand under her hand and she woke up. She woke up and she looked. She goes, hey, hey, Pastor Mike. Hey, there's my brother. And she looked around and she laid back down and that was it. And I, you know what? I was there for that one moment for that guy. That guy was distressed. He was distraught. He hadn't talked to her in a while. And he needed something. And God moved. Okay? So you know what? I really didn't have time for that that day. I really didn't. I knew I didn't. I knew there was a lot of things going on. It's family day, right? No, no. That's not what Jesus said. He said, you do what I tell you, son. I'll work it out. You know, we did make it to dinner. We had a good dinner. We were right on time. Amen. Amen. So... But listen, um, you know, most people are sensitive to, to several things, okay? But the five things that we're most sensitive to is when we see, hear, taste, touch, and smell. The senses of the flesh. You know, I'm not going to call it a sixth sense, okay? All right, but, but when you're in the Spirit and you're walking with God and God's talking to you, you know. You know, you know, you know, you have no doubt. You know, I say, well, I don't know which way to go, which way to do. And I can tell you story after story how God has guided me over the years. I went to Seagrass. The first time I was there, I think we had two ladies. It was the first service they'd ever had there. I did it. And at the end, I asked Kay, I said, what do you think? She goes, I think this is where we're supposed to be. I said, yeah, me too. And we've been there six years. It's like Hibernia. Did God say... It, God, God never told me to go anywhere. And you know what? I'm not going to go anywhere until God tells me. God said, go on a mission trip. God said, be faithful to the church. Be a part of what God would have. So that's what I do. I'm not perfect. And I got the foot in the mouth disease sometimes. I'll tell you, I do. I really do. But um, some of the things that come from the flesh, and I see this in people, even in Christians, is anger and bitterness. And it creeps in when the flesh is not satisfied. And you know, we say that there's three things that can mess us up. The world, the devil, and the flesh. And the world, the devil, and the flesh. And you know what the devil, John 10, 10 says he wants to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said in John 10 that I have come to give you an abundant life. Now, and you, everybody goes, oh yeah, well when I get to heaven, what a day that'll be, right? Amen? But I'm going to tell you something. He wants you to have an abundant life here. You know, now, if you're, you're going to get persecuted for his name's sake, but he's got a plan for you, a good plan, an Ephesians 2.10 plan, okay? So he has a great plan for you. But most times, we forget and we walk by. Instead of walking by faith, we walk by sight. I mean, how many times out of the day can you say that you're in the Spirit? How many times out of the day can you say, I'm walking in the Spirit, I'm walking with God, I'm listening, instead of saying, you know, uh, uh, you want an example of how you mess up? You go out here on 17 and get in the fast lane, and I'll let you know right, right quick what's going on. I still can't get over that people drive 45 miles an hour in that lane. I just haven't figured that out yet. And, uh, and I'm, I, you know, I thought as I got older, I'd have more patience, but it's not really happening. <laughs> But listen, you, wanna, you, wanna, you, you start to lose your sensitivity to God. You start to lose your love for God. You know, in Ephes the church of Ephesus, uh, I'll tell you what, and I, I wasn't going to bring this up, but I'm going to tell you something. 
I have lost my, my first love for a period of time. And I got it back. And I'm going to tell you when, you, when you lose it, you, and it's the same thing, I drifted away. I was teaching the word. I was going to church. I was doing my thing. And I was being righteous, holy. I, and, you know, the Bible tells us in, in here, and I'm running out of time, so i got to hurry up. Today, lest any of you are hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Listen, we know what sin is. We have the sins of omission, the sins of commission. But listen, we can have, you know, whatever occupies our time and our life can also become our sin. You know, even the ministry, the, the church ministry can become a sin when you put it first before Jesus. Listen, I'm going to tell you, we need to, to not let things occupy us. You know, I, here I am, I could sit here and tell you every sin, and you're like, yep, that, that'll get you away from God. That'll, and I don't have to do that, though. I don't have to do that, because you know. But I'm going to tell you, wait, your family, you can drift away from, from your family. You can drift away from your work. You can drift away from just being around the house. Oh, here's a good one, sports. Anybody watch basketball right now, huh? Alec, go Alabama right now. Anyways, um, I wanted the Gators to do something, but they didn't. But you know what? Basketball, football, baseball, boom, next thing you know. And I'm telling you, if you know everything about every sport, you need to get your nose back in the Bible because you know too much about that, okay? And that's the truth right there. You could drift away even on stuff that's not sin. Oh, the Hallmark Channel. Or, hey, what about this? The Home Fix-It Channel. I, you can get addicted to that one too, right? Huh? Yeah. Anything that, that, is, that draws you away from God becomes your sin, okay? Anything that is a priority to you more than Jesus. You know, I've got to where, honestly, and you can ask my wife, and recently, and it's most recently, okay, I've actually come home and I'll just, I'll just go straight in and I'm in my Bible, man. And that's what I want to do. Now, I still need to be a part of the family, but, whoo, man. God has opened my eyes up to stuff that I've never even seen. As a matter of fact, I haven't even said anything out of my notes yet tonight. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. So, so listen, number two is the cause. All right. So we have the crisis, and then number two is the cause. Well, we know the sin. Sin is the cause, okay? Sin is the cause. The sin of omission, the sin of commission. Um, James says, um, you know, and a lot of times we'll say, well, hey, my sin's not as bad as the other guys. And I'll look at somebody that's done worse, and I've, it makes me feel better about myself, right? But here's the thing. For whoever, James 2.10 says, whoever shall keep the whole law yet stumble at one point is guilty of all. And that's it right there. All right? So don't think that you're any better than anybody else. You know, and you say, oh, well, what about them homosexuals? Or what about that adulterer? Or what about that murderer? It ain't no different. That's the country boy in me. It's, it's not any different. You know, the, and I wrote down this, truth is really all we have. But we have to be careful, okay? And I wrote this down, let's see. A lot of people don't let the Bible get in the way of what they believe, okay? Now, I'm going to say it one more time. A lot of people don't let the Bible get in the way of what they believe. And you know what? You're, you know, I see this a lot that... I see even in, even in my in my area where I where I have my ministry. I only have a few people that bring their Bible. Now I know you guys are the faithful that come, but even the faithful can have a hard heart. Even the faithful can have an evil heart. Even the faithful, isn't that crazy? You know, and if you want to find out, go look in Mark six. You know, after Jesus had fed over 5,000 men and, and women and children, it was probably about 15,000 people in Mark 6, the boys get on a boat, and they were constrained. They didn't really want to go across on that boat. They were followers, man. They get out there on the sea. Jesus is over praying on a mountain. Next thing you know, he walks out in the middle of the night to them. And in, in John 6, it tells us that he, he stops the wind and the sea, they were fearful. And then next thing you know, the boat was translated to the other side. And they were so amazed. But if you look into the next verse, it says that they had a hard heart. You know, doing ministry, picking up 12 bagnets of fish and bread and all that work they were doing. 
They just forgot all about what really happened. And that's how quick you can get away, even in the church, okay? So don't, don't think that you can't get away in the church. So sin is definitely there. But listen, listen, there is a cure. There is a cure, okay? So now we're at the cure, okay? Now, now listen, it says um, in verse 14, it says, For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our confidence steadfast, to the end. You know what? I don't want to go out with a whimper. Hey, who wants to go out with a whimper? Raise up your hand. You know? Nobody does. I want to go out with a shout. I want to be excited. I want to show. I want to walk up the mountain unabated like Moses. You know? I want to look out. I want to see the promised land. I want to be a part of what God has. Amen. And uh, so, yeah. So, listen. That's what we want. You know? But, but, you know, this group had rebelled. And so, he says it again. He says, today, if you will hear his voice. Listen, today, you know, I was thinking about this, okay? And I'm going to try and finish up. I'm running out of time. 1 Samuel 30, okay? David had been under attack. The Amalekites invaded Ziklag. They took all the women. They burned the village. The Amalekites took, the, took captive women, children, and David's two wives, okay? And everyone was distressed, and the people even spoke of stoning David, Okay? So if you read this, it's in uh, 1 Samuel 30, 4 to 6. It says that, and I, and I don't have time to explain more, but David, it says, encouraged himself in the Lord. David encouraged himself in the Lord. You know, a lot of times, it's great to be a part of the church, and we shouldn't forsake the assembling of ourselves, which is the manner of some. We need to be a part. We need to be encouraging one another, and that's what the Scriptures tell us. Here, and we need to help exhort. Verse 13 says to exhort one another. And we need to encourage one another. But listen, it's not about a goosebump. It's not about a feeling. It's about trusting God. Believing what the, God's word says and doing it. Trust and obey. What's the, what's the song say? There's no other way. That is the way. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that I know, and I, let me see if I wrote this down. You know, God will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Right? Hebrews 13 tells us that. God is always there for you. All right? You know, a lot of times, where are you, God? Where have you been? He's right there. He's right here. And look, if you didn't bring him with you, I brought him with me. He's here right now. Okay? You know what the problem is? The problem is, God is always, think of it like a radio wave, okay? God is always there. God's always connected. God's love never fails. The problem is us. And when you drift away, when you have unbelief, when you're not in the word of God, when you're not following, when you're not trusting, that's when your problems rise up, okay? That's when you fade away. That's when you, will, that's when you lose track of what you're really doing, okay? Okay? You know, we forget the promises of God. And I'm going to finish up here in just a second. The promises. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him are amen to the glory of God through us. That's all the promises of God. You know, in 2 Peter, he said, His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. So he's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. You got to believe that, right? Huh? You're going to walk in it? How about this? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Good night, man. I'm telling you, I could go around. I could name every, every blessing one by one. I could tell you what the Lord has done. It's awesome, too. Okay? Ephesians 2.19 says, You're no longer strangers and foreigners, but you're fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You know what? Check this out. God has a picture of me in his wallet. Okay? You want to encourage yourself like David? You can go around and say, I am a child of the Most High God. God loves me. God will never leave me or forsake me. God has my picture in his wallet, and he loves me. Thing is, God's love never fails. God loves you right now. 
The problem is not him, it's us, okay? That's the truth right there, okay? And listen, you know, and when we read in John 8, it says the truth will set you free, okay? And I'm going to tell you something. The freedom doesn't come from here. It comes from here. And you heard many preachers say over the years that, that, that heaven and hell is 18 inches. It's between your head and your heart. you got to open up your heart and let the word come in and let it come in and absorb into you. Take, peel the layers away, the scar tissue away so you can love again. John 13, Jesus said, I command you that you, I give us a new commandment that we love one another. I think we're missing that sometimes. But it's like the first catechism. When you get all that, then you can enjoy God now and forever. Okay? And that's the best part. I have much more, but I'm out of time. So I'm going to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. Father, as we've looked in your word, and we see what you say. Maybe there's somebody here today that needs to turn to repent from our unbelief. You know, Father, I know what the greatest sin is now. The greatest sin is not believing you. That's the greatest sin. Help us to believe you. Father, help our unbelief. Help us to believe you, God, to trust you, to obey you. And let us take that first step. For anyone here that needs it. And Father, if there's someone here tonight that doesn't know you, Lord, that you came and you died on the cross for us. You were buried and rose on the third day. And if there's somebody here that doesn't know you personally as Lord and Savior and they're missing out, Father, I pray that they'll come and help and then we'll be able to lead them in the right direction. Father, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you're going to do. And I look forward to being a part of it with you. And I pray everyone in here is the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Mike, thank you, brother. Will you show your appreciation for Brother Mike? <clears throat> you know, tonight I was thinking, as probably you were, you know, and up on the screen it talked about exhortation and encouragement. You think about uh, exhortation, a lot of us have trouble with that word maybe sometimes, but it's the idea of putting your arm around someone and say, we could do this together. And you did that for us tonight, brother. You put your arm around us. Thank you for that. And the encouragement, I love the word encouragement because it's placing courage inside another. And we get that through God's word. And to avoid that unbelief, we got to stay true to the word. We got to stay in the word so the word stays in us. So thank you. God bless you for that. I hope each one of you received a prayer guide tonight. Uh, I want to draw your attention to the bottom right-hand portion of that. It said, praise for our Easter services all across our campuses. We had an amazing Sunday. We had a lot of people serving, a lot of great things happening. We had salvations, baptisms. Um, we had uh, new guests come, and we had uh, just a lot of people come. Thank you for the effort that was put into that. I know God was honored in that. Um, I'm going to um, end us in prayer. And be before I do that, be aware that we still have our table groups outside on the east foyer to my right, to your left. If you have any questions about that or even salvation, please uh, find us at Connect Point. We'd love to talk to you, okay? Let me pray, and then you'll be dismissed. God, thank you so much for your love for us. God, thank you that you demonstrated your love to us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God, thank you that you demonstrate the ultimate sacrifice of love because you are obedient to the Father. God, we benefit from your mercy and your compassion. God, we're forever grateful. God, thank you for even this next portion as we go to our table groups, as we fellowship together, and as we even go home. God, may we constantly think about you, but more than just thinking about you, God, may we hear from you through your word. Help us to set aside time every single moment to not just learn from you, but to be changed by you. God, we love you. 